Jan Johnson in the house. Uh, appreciate you coming out here and doing this. This is, uh, you've, like I told you earlier, this has been kind of on my bucket list is to have you uh, come in and do the podcast. I grew up watching all the Sky Systems. I attended one of your camps at Maine South. Wow. Um, way yeah. back in the day, probably like 04, 05. Me and Jim Lonergan. Jim Lonergan, big yep. Jim Lonergan. Yep. Actually, he's Great been over guy. here. He's been yep. over here. I don't doubt that Rice. for a second. Yeah. That guy's awesome. Yeah. So uh, we actually are fortunate enough to ha- do this in person, which normally we do it like over Zoom. Like, obviously, if I talk with Mondo, it's not going to be like, you know, yeah. in person. Maybe one day, but it's much better because you can, f- you, I think the conversation flows a little bit better when we're in person. And oh, things for like sure. That, so. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I guess we start with, you know, for those people who don't know, um, which if you don't know Jan Johnson and the pole vaulting community, you've been just, you know, living under a rock for the last They might have been sleeping or something like that. You know, it's a long sleep. (laughs) So what's your kind of, you know, like a a synopsis of your your background and kind of where you grew up and how you got involved with pole vaulting? Well, we grew up on Steger Road. On the south, on the southernmost end of Cook County. In fact, uh, on the north side of Steger Road, you're in Cook County. On the south side, you're in Will County. And I went to probably one of the best pole vault high schools in America, Bloom High School in mm-hmm. Chicago Heights, and had a great pole vault coach. But for two or three years before I got there, we jumped in our barn. We lived on 40 acres, and I jumped hay bales with a pitchfork in the barn all the time. Really? We would go out and milk the cows. Hold feed. on. Is this a real story? This is absolutely true. This is absolutely true. <laughs> Tim, no, true. Tim and I both. My sister, too. The three of us. And uh, that, that's how I learned. I could, jump, I could jump two and a half hay bales, two hay bales. Uh, laying on the on the low side, and then one hay bale on the on the on the stack side uh, before I got to high school. How did you like learn that that was like something that you wanted to do? Did you just naturally like, hey, I could use this stick to get over these hay bales, or had you seen it? Starting before? when I start, saw it on TV, watched John Bra- Don Bragg uh, uh, jump on TV, and said, "Heck, I can do that." And then my dad's a plumbing contractor, uh-huh. so we had copper tubing half inch and three quarter inch copper tubing all the time. Okay. But that we would, that he would do plumbing with. And that was a big day when I went from half inch to three quarter inch copper. Well, I was going to (laughs) say like, wouldn't copper, wouldn't that bend? Wouldn't that like No, no, I'm little. I'm, I'm, I'm 10, you know, 12 years old, something like that. So yeah. And that jump with copper tubing, sand floor in the barn. Right. Right. So not a box, just plant in the sand and run on the sand. Yeah, I mean that's how I started too. Uh, we yeah. we used to just string up uh, stuff between bushes and jump in the backyard yep. and yep. And uh, one thing that we did when we were younger that my dad like always uh, my dad's been I don't know if you're familiar with with my dad and his background, but he uh, he's you know it's probably similar background to you. He grew up in a little town in Woodlawn, Illinois, it was like 300 people down in southern yep. Illinois, and. You know, just figured it out in his backyard. And one thing that he used to do as a kid was like, is like creek vaulting, yep. like, you know, just jumping over creeks. And so we used to go out to a uh, forest preserve by our house and we used to just cut down trees. Probably shouldn't, you know, cut down the trees, but, you know, <laughs> back, back in the day, we didn't, you know, we didn't think about that. So we, we would cut down the trees and then we would uh, jump over the creeks, just run at the creek, plant the yep. pole in the creek, and then, and yep. then, you know, I jumped over a creek. I landed flat on my back in a creek one time <laughs> on a ditch willow, using a ditch willow for a pole vaulting pole. Right. Well, you know, to be honest with you, I think that is sometimes I think kids going straight to a pole vaulting pit could be not That's as right. good of a way. I agree. Yeah. That's not the way I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like to, I teach a lot of pole vaulting as you guys know, uh, but I like to teach grass vaulting uh, a little bit first, kind of get the feel of that, holding a low grip, mm-hmm. right? Not having a plan in a box right? and uh, just getting the feel of that. That's just getting the feel of the beginning elements of the sport, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. And trusting the pole, trusting yeah. to, to hang from that top hand because everybody wants to pull themselves up. That's and true. That's, uh, yeah. So why, so at, we're at rise right now, um, for those of you just listening and, you know, I've always wanted to, in that spot we were talking about putting in another pit, I yep. was like, well, 
you know, for a beginner, a sand pit is, is a great, a great, you know, way to learn how to pole vault. And so I was like, well, we should put a sand pit over there and that creates a whole big mess and things like that. You'd but, have to do a little concrete chopping right yeah, there. Right? That would be some work in yeah, my opinion, yeah. if you know what I mean. Well, I cut out these boxes myself. Like uh, we, you know, with the jackhammer, you know, cut them and, and jackhammer. And that was the first time I'd ever like used a jackhammer. And I don't ever want to use a jackhammer ever, <laughs> <laughs> ever again, man. Destructing, like doing demo on uh, um, on concrete is not fun. I grew up. Uh, I'd go to work with my dad starting when I was 11 or 12. He was, like I said, he was a plumbing contractor and I'd do jackhammering and plumbing work all the time as a kid. Oh, and then gosh. a little bit of farm work and back. And frankly, I think that type of work was good for me because oh, it yeah. makes you strong. Absolutely. Um, and it makes you strong. And, and, I, and I think in a good way for pole vaulting, you mm-hmm. know, so, you know, and I, and I grew up uh, on the cusp of the change from metal poles to fiberglass poles. So I was a freshman in high school in 1965, and uh, we I jumped on metal pole all all freshman year. I jumped 10 feet on a metal pole freshman year, and then we switched to glass sophomore year. How did ju- that happen? I I, I mean I. I- I know that there was a transition, you know, from bamboo to steel to to uh, to fiberglass. But how how did that transition to fiberglass? Do you know like the background of how that happened? Like who was the first one to do it and things well, like that? Herb Jenks, I think, was the inventor of fiberglass, and uh, they were experimenting with it. And then uh, our friend George Davies was the first guy to really jump really good on fiberglass who so herb jenks built the first fiberglass pole yep. and yep. where was that at that was in california that that, that herb jenks uh, was the original um um catapult guy yeah yeah catapult yeah oh wow yeah and That's... then a couple other guys got into it there was a lot of belly aching about um, among people if the rules should allow the bending of poles and allow fiberglass right. all, all the guys that jumped high uh on steel and and uh bamboo um you know they didn't like it and of course bamboo bent a little bit too if you had the right size right um you know so we saw we we, we saw a little bit of that there were bamboo still poles being jumped on uh my first couple of years in high school actually yeah. And how did they, do you know how they managed that? Did they, did people just say, no, deal with it? I think eventually the rule, the, 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 the world record was changing so many times in the early mid sixties that uh, I don't think there was any slowing it down. Right. It certainly changed the dynamic of the sport in many, many, many ways, you right. know. As you guys probably know, I've worked a lot on pole vault safety, and of course, a lot of that is about, you know, the landing pits and all that type of stuff uh, to make it safer. Mm-hmm. Because, um, you know, we went from sand landing on sand to landing on sawdust to uh, the early fiberglass pits. The, the pit we jumped on at Bloom High School was basically a big box, a wagon the size of a pole vault pit with foam chunks in it and uh, no front buns. With like hard edges? Yep. No, I got, uh, yeah, oh no, I got, I got a couple, I got a good, I got a good picture I can show you here in my phone if you want to look at it. Uh, yeah, I jumped you? 15 feet on that in high school. No front bun. Just plywood sides all the way around, covered with canvas, no front buns. Just straight up and down in the front. And it was it like how how big was it like what could you miss could you hit the side and like I never snap saw, in I, half? I don't remember anybody ever missing the side and there was no regulations for how big the pit needed to be right yeah <laughs> that's crazy. no regulations for that well I mean you know <clears throat> so when you introduce the fiberglass pole I mean it changes the whole safety profile of the sport absolutely yeah. I mean, that Still must today. have been, like, all, all, crazy. All you have to do is look over there in that wall. That tells you a lot of the story. Right. Right? Absolutely. No doubt. And it's taken a long time since the mid-60s into the 70s, 80s, 90s for people to kind of figure out the resistance factor and going to a bigger pole when you're blowing through and all those type of things. Absolutely. 
Yeah, so I wasn't planning on getting to this until you know later on <laughs> in, so much in to the talk podcast. About, big guy. But uh, yeah. I mean, you know, so you're so first of all, can you explain your position in the safety and and what what that all is? Because I I've I hear these things from the grapevine, and mm-hmm. I just am really excited that I get to hear it from the source uh, today. Well, I I um, started running camps in 1973 and um, in California I, no our first camp was at Bloom High School we ran camp there a couple three years then I went to grad school at SIU Carbondale and then we ran camps where people came and stayed over over the night and stayed in the dorms and everything and uh, that that um, I, 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 I would see so many well and then well actually 1970 uh, Bill Hatcher and I were coaching um Bruce Jenner, uh, mm. Tad Scales, guys like that. It, they would just come and jump with us at at, at University of Kansas, uh, just helping kids out, trying to figure out how to pole vault. Bruce was an absolute beginner when right. we when we helped him, you know. And uh, Tad Scales, who jumped sixteen low in high school, was one of the best high school guys. He was a Lawrence, Kansas high school kid. We just, I just I've always had fun helping kids do this sport it's just fun to me right that was even when i was competing as a world-class guy it yeah. was just fun and that my little brother would be the same way teaching him and the other kids at bloom gee whiz we had at bloom high school during tim's era and after tim's era we probably had there was four or five guys that jumped high 15s or 16 feet at, oh, yeah. at that high school uh they were loaded all the time and it so i, I think the information on technique in the assignment of polls and all that just got passed along from person to person to person. And in that fall, I mentioned a little while ago, George Hamlin, a uh, high school physics and math teacher. He loved it. He, he got it. He figured it out. He helped me, uh, figure it out. And, you know, and he coached, uh, he coached Ike Jefferson, uh, fifth, 1959 indoor high school record, 13, five, 1959. Wow. 135 on metal pole. That's crazy. Yeah, the high school just had a history of it. So I think that part of teaching the method, teaching the drills, teaching those things and they've obviously changed a lot over the years as fiberglass poles have developed and all that. Right. And people figured out technique, but that that's really that's really to me what it's all about. Just fun to do. And what is your uh, role as far as safety goes in the United States. Well, like- D- Dean Starkey and I own the Pole Vault Safety Certification Board website. We started that, oh my gosh, I couldn't even tell you what year. We probably certify, you go online and you study the materials and then you take a test. That's mm-hmm. really what it is. And look at videos and we explain things. And we do a couple thousand, couple thousand uh, coaches a year because there's always coaches turning over in our sport, mm-hmm. you know, right. So that, 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 that's really what that's, that, what that's really, that's been all about. And then not long after that, I started, uh, working on pole vault safety projects, making the pits bigger. Um, you know, the box collar was my invention. Um, basically a lot of it was just padding hard surfaces. Right. Do you know about my padded box work that we've done? Um, yeah, so that's one big thing that yeah, we could is, talk about is that. very, it's, so it's, it's controversial. And the thing that, that bothers me is, is this is, you know, like I, I don't know where I'm at with it. Um, but I have a few thoughts on it. Number one is everybody can do your job better <laughs> until they got to do it. <laughs> that's one of my favorite quotes nice comment big guy. nice comment I'll, i can't argue that one thank you so <laughs> so i do realize that there are people you know from the peanut gallery that will chirp at you and say well you did this for money or you did this yeah. for that or you did this for this don't forget what elvis presley said what it's all about the money honey if you want to get along with me 1957 and not a goddamn thing has changed since 1957 as far as the money goes honey sorry everybody if you want to delete that out that's your prerogative big guy okay i'm not going to argue it um well i mean so so yeah so 
there I'll- there's there's you know <laughs> there's a lot that to unpack in that situation. So obviously the pole vault is a dangerous event if not instructed properly and the problem is is that we've got a lot of people that don't know how to instruct and then we've yep. got some people right. that have no coaches and That's right. and then so so how do you go about trying to keep those people safe? And so I think that in my opinion I think that the box collar was, you know, your best effort at that time to pad as many surfaces as possible and trying to reduce the amount of effect that it would have on a pole vault. During my time, we made the pits bigger. Mm -hmm. We've uh, made the pits longer and wider. Pits only used to come to the inside edge of the standards for many years. For sure. Uh, The pits were only 11 or 12 feet from the box to the back of the pit. And that was all fine in the, in the later days of, of, of bamboo and metal poles and that type of thing. But when glass started, everything changed. Oh, yeah. You could land in a whole lot different places oh, and all yeah. that. So I worked on all those projects and got the, got the National High School Federation to make the pits bigger and make them longer and pad the standard bases – that was also my invention. I really? didn't, it wasn't patented, but it right. was just something that I showed them how to do. And they've listened very carefully, uh, bringing the front bonds out uh, a measured amount. Uh-huh. I also worked on and, and Peter McGinnis and a couple of others uh, have also worked on some of these projects. Um, so what went into the development of the box collar? Where did you start? Why did you start it? And where, where is it at now? Seeing people land in the box and I'd done, I probably done 40 expert witnessings on pole vault accident cases, 40 or 50 pole vault accident cases during my time mm. of doing this over the last 40 or 50 years or however long it's been. Um, and so I just, uh, elected to work on those things. And the box collar was something that we did in my backyard at my sky jumpers pole vault club. Um, I took a box. Well, the original box collar was also our invention, uh, where we didn't pad the inside quarters and edges of the box where we just had a, you know, a flat piece of uh, it was foam. It much, much thinner too. Much thinner and, yeah. it, and it basically padded uh, around the perimeter of the box. Yeah. So, but then, but, but, but it was obvious uh, in my mind that it, because it slides around in the box collar we have today slides around. I, in my view, it's, it's good. It's safer, but it's a pain in the butt sometimes. Well, we bolt it ours moves. down. Yeah. And you you're know, supposed to, that's what it says in the book, but, they, but <laughs> right. people don't do that. Well, that's a great point. So that's a really, really good point. Yep. Okay. Well, you're going to, if, if I'm, I'm not, I, like I said, I don't know where I'm at with the whole thing. And, and I personally, if you, if you have good coaching, you know, that's the safest thing you can do for a pole vaulter. I think everybody would agree on that. But, um, you know, if you don't have people, you know, landing in the box and the box mm-hmm. collar doesn't really, mm-hmm. you know, you could you could potentially be like, well, it's it's affecting this or it's affecting that um, if your kids are landing in the pit. Yep. But then one kid goes up. That's right. And then comes down. Just takes one one bad mistake. One it's guy. Like, no, I like the box collar now. One guy. <laughs> That's right. Take only takes one guy that tries to hold too high. Uh or maybe the wind turns around and it was a tailwind and now it's a headwind and you don't make the right adjustments. Uh or you come down and have a bad plant or you have a bad run or you pick up the wrong pole, or you hold too high on the pole. Uh, You know, there's a lot of ways you can end up landing short. So on the box collar, uh, I just took the old box collar that we had, and um, I added added those sidewalls that go Mm -hmm. down on the inside edges and curve some things out a little bit, and uh, just taped it all together with the pole vaulter's best friend. Duct tape? Gorilla tape. 
Hey. So such a good yes. guess, though. Such a darn no, good guess. That's BS because tape I from use gorillas. Think about it. I use gorilla tape all the time. <laughs> I didn't think you knew what gorilla tape was. So there's a joke going around. Uh oh, I mean, look this white right I here. I see what you got. Gorilla here. tape. Gorilla tape. The whole first facility that we built was basically built with gorilla tape. I love gorilla. Tape. Sometimes I do gorilla tape with spray tack. What spray tack? Well, well, they got the gorilla spray too. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's good right. Stuff. That's right. Yeah, we do it that way too. You know, because indoors here, this is one thing. But if you're outdoors and you mm. did this in California or Illinois or someplace, uh, that that might be another thing. But uh, that that type of spray adhesive uh, is good sometimes. So you gorilla taped your the original prototype light, together. Clean it up, little light, little light layer of uh, of spray tack, and then let it let it dry for a few hours, and then uh -huh. put gorilla tape on top of it. Sticks even better. That's what I'm talking don't about. Don't ever tell the gorillas I said that, though. <laughs> I don't want them coming by my place, you know, looking me up. You know what I'm talking about? Uh -huh. You know, and a lot of those gorilla tapes, you know, they have United and American Airline Freak of Flyer Miles, which, of course, that means they can go anywhere pretty much any time they want. <laughs> yeah, the, the gorilla tape is, is legit. So, yeah. you, so you took your idea, yep. you, you took your original box collar yep. idea, which I think, so a lot of people will be like, oh, yeah, uh, just go back to the original box collar. Now, I do have a case study personally. Mm -hmm. um, my middle brother, Josh, broke his back with the original got box collar, like broke his lower back just because he landed, you know, on, on that edge, you know, and, and it probably just wasn't thick enough. And I'm, I wonder if that would have happened with the new one. The new one, I think, probably would have protected that. Good question. But the old box collar... I think it was it was better than nothing, but um, I wonder if people would argue that this one, if you land in the box, is safer than the last one. You probably couldn't argue that it's not safer if you land in the box. Cushioning on the top edges is on the inside walls is thick. In fact, I'll just tell you a little story. So here, I've, so for a year and a half, we jumped on my prototypes on the box collar uh -huh. at my place. Okay. And then I showed it to Dave Hodge, who's mm -hmm. the guy at Gill Athletics, who I coached in high school, my, I might add. He's my, he's my, uh, one of my dad's best friends. There you go. They, they grew up Great together. guy. They grew up Great together. guy. Awesome. Yeah. Southern Illinois guy. Yeah. And I showed it to him and we filed a patent on it and uh, won it. And uh, then during that time frame, um, we did impact testing, force impact testing on it. And uh, we tested the inside walls, the top edges. And you want to know the truth? Huh. The box collar they came up with was thicker on the inside padding on the walls than I wanted. And mm -hmm. I belly ached and bitched about it and bitched about it. And they came out with it anyway. Is that right? And, and why uh, and why did you not want it that thick? I just thought it was uh, coming into the middle of the box too much, and I felt like it was going to move around. If it was going to move around, it was going to be a problem, and that's what it looks like sometimes to me. And that's so. what. So that's why I think it's really important that we talk to you today, and people understand this because people would have never thought that they would have never known that if we would have talked, it's not something I go out and tell everybody, but yeah. well, but that's the thing is that it's like, okay, well, you know, yeah. you didn't want that because that's the biggest argument is like, well, it's making the box narrower and then it's unsafe because people can't plant into it. The well, problem, the problem was not with me and Gill athletics. The problem was with, with, uh, ASTM. What's that? The American society for testing and materials. You see, there's an ASTM for almost everything uh, that's done in construction today. In those in those uh, metal posts right there, there's an ASTM for it. For the rubber track surfacing, there's an ASTM for it. For uh, what the structure's like on those uh, on those uh, you know metal seats over there. Uh, ASTM uh, I've been a member of for over 30 years. There's an ASTM for the pole vault pit. There's an ASTM for uh, the box collar. There's an ASTM for all kinds of things out there. I tried to make an ASTM for the pole vaulting poles and for the uh, assignment of weight values and the way that is done. And I could never get it through because of the other big thing that Elvis Presley never sang about. 
What's that? Politics. Uh huh. See, the big three is politics, sex, and money. Yep. As you guys probably know, or maybe I had that in the reverse order: <laughs> sex, politics, and money. No, money, sex, and politics. Okay. Anyway, that that's what happens. You see, the manufacturers and people who are truly interested in it, uh, in these type of things, they have a meeting a couple of times a year. Actually, the Povolt Subcommittee, F08.67, uh, meets one time a year. And it's about making the sport safer, but it's also a lot about politics. And politics as in, um, so this ASTM, this means that there's a standard, this means that there's a standard for like the foam in a pole vault Correct. pit. And there's a standard. How thick it is, how, how thick, soft okay. it is, what the impact attenuation is. You see, an impact attenuation, uh, there's, a, there's a machine um, that, has a, that has a ball on, uh, on, a, on a wire, uh, and it's about the size of a human head. Mm-hmm. And you can drop that ball from any height you want, pretty much, all the way up to about 13 feet. And uh, it tells you, um, it tells you, it measures the impact on things. So if we drop that ball onto that concrete floor over there, right. uh, from the impact height that we use in pole vaulting, which is 12 and a half feet, uh, it would measure around 10,000 hick head injury criteria the abbreviation is hick mm. and uh if and if we dropped it onto this rubber uh track surface here on a floor that would be about 8500 hick mm. 3000 hick in injury a hit of 3000 hick is almost certain death Jeez. in an impact oh no, and we're yeah. talking 10,000 on concrete and the concrete that's around the box, and every goddamn pole vault box in the world, damn near every pole vault box in the world, is inserted in the ground how? Uh, that's right. Plate steel right. sunk in concrete. concrete. Yeah. That's how dangerous it is. And we're not even talking about the edges yet. We're just talking about a flat surface. So uh, when there's I... a different stress tw- from the edges. That's right. Okay. And... Of course, an edge is putting a lot more force onto this one right, than right, a flat right. surface. Yeah, yeah. So 25 years ago, my good friend Eddie Cease, a pole vaulter friend of mine from the Bay Area, says, Hey, Jan Johnson, you should, uh, you should get involved with the American Society in Testing Materials, ASDM. Right. That's what we should do. And so for 10 or 15 years, he and I worked on it, and uh, I learned about and did a bunch of impact testing on different materials and things so that we set those things up. It was a lot of work. I How drive long up, did it take from the beginning of the develop, like the idea of you gorilla taping this, let's do the new box collar, the, the current one. Yeah. So from you gorilla taping it until you finally get the patent and then this new uh, rule comes into effect. How long was that? It's probably five, four, three to five years. Three I don't remember exactly, years. but yeah, it'd take right. about that long to go through ASTM. And we're doing the same thing on the box right now. Yeah, I want to get to the box. There's well, we should talk. We should. Yeah, I, I agree. We should talk about it, but we should talk about other things right now. It's gotten too serious. In yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, but it's I think just it's important because some people don't know that they, they they just don't understand what goes on. Well, and I mean, I think the biggest thing is is just like uh, you know, what do you say to people who say you know you did that just so you can make money? If they understood how much time was involved in it, because mm-hmm. those people have no time involved, uh, if they understood how much money is involved in it, in the development of it. Now, the box collar, yeah, that was my initial invention, and I showed it to Gil, and they loved it. Uh, and they took they, they basically took it over after that, and we shared the patent. But we still had all this impact testing and and, 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 and watching it get jumped on and all that was done in our, at our club. Right. We d- went through several prototypes. The prototypes that I wanted, unfortunately, didn't make it through ASTM 
because the guys at ASTM wanted the that wanted the material to be thicker uh, on the inside walls. <clears throat> right, right. Yeah, I think um, not the, everybody that's involved in making the rules is interested in making it safer. Some of them are just involved in money and who owns things and stuff like that. And right. that makes sense if you think about it. You know, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, that's kind of how business works is you find a problem and then you find a product something that's that right fixes the problem that's right, and then if you're if you do that, then you mm. you know you become a beneficiary of mm. that product because of the time and things that you put into it, so mm -hmm. I think it's it's just uh I don't know it, look at it, look at pole vaulting poles, for instance, now there's no a s t m for pole vaulting poles. But if you look at how yeah. much more you can bend pole vaulting poles today in today's world than you could when I was at the world class level, it's ridiculous. Right. We'd raise our grip and the pole would break. I, did, I had four or five of those type of accidents. Right. Well, that makes you not want to raise your grip anymore. Right. It makes you it makes you a little bit unhappy about pole vaulting. But you, when you look at how much Mondo is bending the pole and the other guys that are jumping 18, 19 feet in today's world, um, they're not running any faster. They're not jumping up or planting any better. They can just bend the pole more because the manufacturers are making the poles better so they can be bent more. Right. But there's no ASTM for that. And do you think there should be? I don't know if you can do it or not. Right, because it's just such a variable thing. I did a lot of work on the assigning of weight values and trying to get that through ASTM and I failed. Mm. That was five or six years of work to try to do that. Really? I still have all the data. I've got everything I can send it all to you. Uh, it made perfect sense, but I couldn't get it done. They didn't want to do it. They'd vote against it because it ends, it ends up, it comes down to a vote at the subcommittee level. That's the pole vault group. Mm. And then it goes to the main group and it comes down to a vote there. Mm. It's, it's very similar to what happens in the United States Congress, I guess. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, it is. It's, it, it, that's really how it works. So what is your opinion on, uh, well, mm -hmm. about like weight labels and things like that? Because I, I run into it as a coach. I run into <laughs> that problem a lot. Hey, where, hey, oh, hey, hey. Uh oh, <laughs> Yeah. Okay, bring it, big boy. Come on, bring it. It's a big. It's you're not. It's, you're, hey, it's an uh oh. I I run into that uh -oh. problem all the time. Is <clears throat> is it's just like, uh, you know, teaching people to mm -hmm. to properly bend the pole. I don't know if you're familiar with Tim Riley. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. Yep. So I I uh, did a podcast with Tim Riley, and we kind of discussed about how you know there are certain times as a coach that it makes sense for an athlete to vault on a pole potentially under their body weight, depending on where they're gripping and things like that. So <laughs> that, uh oh, that's, that's <laughs> just, so I think that that would be a good conversation is just what, what are your thoughts on that? And is there a way around our current? That's why I worked on that project I was just talking about. Because and your opinion on it is, is the weight rule. Uh oh, <laughs> is, one of the stupidest rules in track and field. There's no weight rule at the international level. There's That's no weight point. rule at the NCAA level. Great point. There's only a weight rule at the high school level. And they made a weight rule based on nothing. There's no ASTM for it. There was no data on it. The manufacturers for a few years had been putting weight labels on the top of the poles. And keep in mind, you know, when I was jumping in high school, we didn't have any. There was no weights. So yeah. I, it was just the way it was. Uh, but every pole over there in y'all's wall uh, has a weight label on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the the high school federation, and I begged them not to do it. I was at, I was at two of the meetings in Indianapolis uh, begging them not to do it and told them I would work on this project and try to get an AST through and I could never ever ever get it done and the truth of the matter is uh, oh, oh and I have a I have a awesome flex machine in my backyard at my facility yeah uh, we flex poles all the time and look at it and the truth is is that generally 
every six inches that you drop your grip is about 10 pounds in weight value. Mm. That's the truth. That's good to know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't know if it was... I never, ever, ever teach kids to jump on poles that are equal to or greater than their body weight. Every single beginner kid is jumping on a pole under their body weight at my place. You Every single one. <laughs> no, I, now you I, guys I, tell me what you do here, okay? <laughs> it's No, it's just, it's very difficult because it's like, it's so subjective. Each pole That's vaulter right. that comes in here is a different pole That's vaulter. Right. And you... It's like, okay, well, I know the proper way that can help them to pole vault the safest. And the problem is, is it's like, in order for that to happen, I have to jump on this pole, but I can't jump on this pole because it's rated underneath their body weight. I wanted to have a rule that allowed for multiple weight labels, or multiple weight categories on poles, but that's illegal too. To have well, more than one label. Didn't Browning used to have That's right. a, because uh, my dad used to love that one, the Browning uh, that you, it's, uh, it told you like at this height, your weight is this much. They were right height. on it. That's Herb Jenks did that. Really? Yep. Yeah, so that I really I think that that I mean that's that's how it is. Like if you were to flex on your flex machine and you were to put your what's it called the span, mm-hmm. you know, if you were to the push width this, of the span, if you were to push it out towards the end of the pole, that's it's right. going to be a different weight than it would be if you brought it in closer. That's exactly right. If you and I are if you and I have a pole and uh, and uh, we're going to carry a a two hundred pound weight in the center of that pole and we're going to carry it across the across the uh to the other side of the parking lot there and we picked a pole up on the ends and it's bending too much wouldn't we just get in closer exactly duh <laughs> it's, i'm it's, sorry it's, re- duh. Well, it's well but that's so how did that happen how did that <laughs> how did that rule kind of come do you know how it kind i of don't know exactly how it came i think yeah, I don't know. I think maybe a manufacturer or somebody said something and the high school federation decided to put that in their rule book that you couldn't jump on a pole under your weight. And we were having a lot of accidents in those days. And I could see why uh, I could see why that would be a problem that way. But I got to tell you, we come and we start from a short run of three lefts at my place when you're a beginner right. on a little pole. And when the pole bends too much, what do we do? Get on a bigger pole. Get on a bigger one. Get on a bigger pole and do it one little step at a time Yeah, on the way back. And then typically by the time you're at your long run, you can jump on a pole that's at or greater than your body weight. Right. And that's, that, that's, that's really the way I teach it at camp. That's the way I've taught it for 50 years. Truth is. Yeah. And then that brings up the question of like, okay, well, what if you, you know, you, you've heard the stories of, of athletes showing up to their high school and they got two poles. And it's mm-hmm. like, well, this right. one doesn't, this one's not at my body weight. The next one's like 50 pounds over my body yep. weight. So I have to jump on that, that one. That ain't going to work either, probably. So this is, so a solution is, you know, rentals, you know, having a rental I service think- that you can interchange poles and poles can grow with you. And high schools can yep. rent poles from local facilities. Yep. I or think what. rental thing has been good. I Especially so with the cost of poles. Oh my gosh. Right. The cost of poles is ridiculous. Right. Right. Exactly. But it's, it kind of comes back to that same thing we were talking about earlier. Find a problem. Yeah. Solve the problem. Yeah. You become a beneficiary of the of the problem, but it also benefits the the athlete too. It's a even trade. It's an even uh, trade. Here, know? I'll just <laughs> I, don't, I can't believe I'm going to tell you the story right now, but let's hear it. You know, they banned the poles that I jumped on in the Olympic Games. Do you guys know all this? Unfair advantage. 1972 Olympic Games, there's this German guy named Adrian Paulin, who's just a creepy looking dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> right? And we start to hear a little something. We're in Oslo, Norway, and I hear something one day that they're not going to let anybody jump on the blue catapults or the green sky, or, uh, or the green sky poles in the Olympic Games. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what? Right. So we are only going to be allowed to jump on the brown poles and the black poles. I didn't think there, there was any way that could be true. And we're in Oslo, Norway. I'm over there jumping in meets. Mm-hmm. And so we end up going to Munich 
and uh, they make everybody check their pulse in a couple of days before the contest. And we walk into the room um, to get our pulse to jump in prelims, and all my pulse are in the band pile. Oh this is an gosh. hour before the contest starts. <coughs> Duh. Now, Whoa. the guy that we were jumping against, you know, was an East German guy, and this guy, Adrian Paulin, I think he was trying to screw Bob Seeger and Steve Smith and I who were the two Olympi- or the three Olympians. So I ran back to the village and borrowed Bruce Jenner's poles, ran back over, uh, had those poles looked at, and they okayed them. Mm. But they were smaller than the poles I jumped on. So what did I have to do to make the finals in the Olympic Games? I ran from 10 lefts all year. For the last three years as a world-class jumper, I'd run from 10 lefts. In the Olympic Games prelims, I jumped from seven. Hello. Whoa. And held about six or eight or nine inches lower than I would normally hold. And I was lucky, and I made finals. That's crazy. It gets crazier. Then uh, my friend Kirk Bride loans me poles for the finals, which are also a little bit smaller but a little bigger than the poles Bruce had. So those poles were already okay. They bitched and collared at me because I was now jumping on somebody else's poles, a Canadian guy's poles, and they had kind of figured it out. But after arguing, they let me jump on Kirk. They weren't going to let you. They weren't going to allow you to correct borrow poles. That's how political it was. Wow, that's crazy. So in the Olympic Games, I take my first jump uh, in warm ups from ten. And blow right through the pole. It's the biggest pole I got. Nobody else is going to loan me a pole out there. Uh, So I eventually, in the Olympic Games, jumped from seven lefts on those poles and jumped 17.7, which is the highest I'd ever jumped from seven lefts on that pole. Instead of holding my typical long-run grip, which is about 15.4 at that time, I think I held about 14.6 or 14.4 or something like that. Whoa. And that's how that that's how it can be in this thing a little bit sometimes. Yeah. And I was 21 years old and extremely naive still, although I'd traveled all over the world and jumped in contests and had a lot of friends in it. But uh, I, I don't I think at that time I didn't understand or believe that the that the politics of it could be that political sized or nationalized or whatever you want to call it. And so that was, was it the 550 plus? Was that the, the pole? Was that what it was called? Yeah, I think it was at that time. And what, what uh, lengths, just cause there's pole vault nerds out there that want to know like lengths. And 16 weights. foot poles. I jumped on 16 foot poles. Okay. Yeah, 16 foot poles. And you're gripping, you know, in that competition. 15, four, 15, four. When I jumped 18 the first time I was holding 15, three or four. Gotcha. In the Olympic Games, I was holding about a, about nine inches lower, wow. eight or nine inches lower and from a shorter took, run. You took the bronze yes. in that. That's yeah, I was very lucky. My parents are in his stands. Think about how much money the Johnsons spent. My parents <laughs> went. My They took my brother and my sister. We flew all the way over, you know, to Munich to watch this. Yeah. It was, it's, you know, the That's pressure insane. is ridiculous, you know, so... You know, and then, of course, the other great thing about my Olympics was then about two days later, uh, I was getting ready to fly back to Tuscaloosa, you know, for for school. I'm already three weeks late. Uh, Right. (laughs) And Black September happens. What was Black September? Well, the Palestinians came in and shot up all the 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 Jewish guys. I was going to ask you, I didn't know that was what it was called. So, yeah. So what was, so you were, you were in there or you were out? No, I was there. You could hear it. We heard it at night. Steve Prefontaine and Bruce and I are roomies. And their dorm... Hold on, hold on. You were roommates with... It was you, Steve Prefontaine, and Bruce Jenner. Correct. That's crazy. (laughs) That's really crazy. Hey, homies, it's hard to get some better roommates than that in history. (laughs) I'll tell you, I got a better story than all those stories. I can. Jeez. You know? Oh, my God. That's crazy. You ever look back on that? Steve and, and I, like, Steve is... and I traveled all over the world together. He was always mad at me because I was better at girl chasing. Is that right? Oh yeah. How so? I was just good at chasing <laughs> girls. You know, girls like me. <laughs> that's, that's why I've been that's... married for forty-seven years. There you go. Um, 
Um, so yeah, so we were we're, talking about the, we're uh, we're in the dorm, we're in the dorm, we're up on about the fourth or fifth floor and and the the village is this series of dorms, big, tall structures with like patios and stuff in between them. And our, our dorm is probably from here to the end of your wall over there, maybe Uh 200 feet away. And you could hear the gunfire at about two o'clock in the morning. It was scary. That's really scary. Yeah. So what'd you guys do? Just tried to stay low and stay the heck out of it, big guy. So you we just... left. I left, and I couldn't. The whole, the whole, the whole campus, the whole thing was locked down. You couldn't uh, come or go out of the village. Uh, they had all the Munich police in there. Um, yeah, it was a big shootout. It was ugly. So it was you're ugly. that so kind of that kind of ended my love for for the sport, frankly. Really, for, for competing in so I just seen so too much of that kind of stuff. Just wasn't good just wasn't good at all politics and that type of thing yeah yeah that's that's yeah. crazy so you're you're laying in bed and so like in that moment like who who wakes well, up first not exactly what happened we were gone we were out and uh we came back and we couldn't get into the front door of the village they weren't letting anybody in or out of the village so um, we went around to the back and we climbed over the fence and got into the village that way and uh, then went up into our dorm. That's how it happened. Wow. That's how I got in. Yeah. That's insane. Climbed over the fence. There's a chain link fence about probably, I don't know, eight or ten feet high. <laughs> That's crazy, And man. pole vaulters are good climbers, unlike distance runners, gentlemen. Yeah. I'll just point that yeah, out Yeah, I to could you. see Bruce getting over that thing pretty yeah. easy. Bruce wasn't on that one, no. That was me and Pre oh, coming gotcha. back, and Bruce was already there. Do you have any uh, <laughs> Whoops. good like any good stories, I'm sure, Uh-oh. with uh, Pre? Many. I'll tell you. The, you want to hear the saddest story? I'll tell you the sure. saddest story first. I was I was in grad school. This is 1975. This is the day pre died in uh-huh. the car wreck, and uh, I was supposed to go out and I would go to Eugene many times for track meets, USA national championships in '71, Olympic trials in '72, other stuff in '73 and '74, and I'd go stay with pre at his place when I'd go. Mm-hmm. all the time we'd travel together all over the world we'd been all over the world together you know right. russia europe everywhere and uh we were just buddies and it was good we were very similar we liked each other we didn't have to compete against each other it was all good that right way, right <laughs> and um we come back and uh all right i i'm supposed to go out to the meet out there and i canceled at the last minute I had something else going on. I'm in grad school at SIU at Carbondale at the time, and I couldn't go, and he was mad at me big time. I called him up and told him I wasn't coming. And uh, two days later, the story's in the paper that he flipped his car on this big, steep road that you got to drive to get to his place coming out of the stadium and uh, and Eugene. And, uh, you know, that's what happened. And St- Steve was a great guy. He was kind of a, a lot of people maybe don't understand it, but he, he was kind of a partier. He liked to do beer drinking oh, contests. Yeah. He was into that stuff a little bit more than I. And, uh, but that's him. He was just a competitive guy that way on all kinds of things. And, um, he was, he was like the first, like, <clears throat> maybe, uh, maybe the last, I don't know. He was just like a track and field rock star. Like that's he, true. And, and he like, that's lived true. That, he like lived that life kind of, I think that that's what really. Yep. And there were some great distance runners in those days too. Frank Shorter, Pre. I mean, there's a bunch of really, U.S. had gotten really, really good in the distance running aspect of it. But I just, I, I still pray to this very day that, I didn't go to that meet because I probably would have been in that car. His little MG midget, convertible MG midget, and he flipped that thing on top of himself, and that's how he killed himself on the turn at the top of that hill. And I just thank God that I didn't go to that meet. I would have been in that car, no question about it. That's crazy. So think about that for a second. Not good, huh? Yeah. That's good. That's really, really yeah. wild. Actually, yeah, I want to go. Uh, we're I'm heading out to my brother's jumping at the U.S. champs in uh, Eugene. Nice. And uh, 
I've been wanting to go and run uh, that Pre's trail mm-hmm. or sure. whatever, yep. kind of just see all that stuff. So, yeah, he was he was. I really enjoyed like growing up. He was a really big hero of mine and a great guy. Just awesome. Just a fun guy. Just a fun cool guy dude. to be with in college. Basically, I mean that's basically what we were. Just two college guys. Yeah, yeah. I went to Alabama. He went to Oregon, but. You yeah, know, and I went to grad school, and he was getting done at Oregon. But that—that's—that's that's really the truth of it. What um, about Bruce? Bruce is a great guy. Yeah. Do you still? Are a, you still in contact? I haven't talked to Bruce in a long time. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. I, I guess he's a girl now. I—I—I I, I, I don't know. I'm. Hey, that's his prerogative. Uh, yeah. Uh, he was a very, very, very serious person. Uh, he was tenth in the Olympics in '72 in the decathlon. Bruce jumped with Bill Hatcher and I a great deal when he was learning how to pole vault uh, in the early days. Uh, do you know all this? Mm-hmm. Bruce jumped off the wrong foot. No, really? And you could not fix it. Hold on. He like, and actually did pretty well off the wrong foot? Jumped 16 feet off the right foot, <laughs> off his right foot. That's crazy. That's a pretty cool story right there. Jeez. If you know anything about pole vault, and that's a good story, huh? Yeah. Yeah, but he was such a good athlete, and he just got better and better and better, uh, I think, over the next four years. I try. Bruce kind of, he motivated me to try to do the decathlon, but I failed at it miserably. I kept getting hurt. and um, That's know, funny. Pull my I... hamstring doing this, pull my hamstring doing that, us, all kind of stuff like that all the time. Not good. Right. We, uh, I got to give, I was on the phone with one of my, uh, friends and mentors this morning. His name's Paul. And, and, uh, I was like, I'm, I'm having a, a podcast with Jan Johnson today. He's like, I competed in the decathlon against Jan Johnson, yep. uh, back in Bloom high school a long time ago. That's I think so, it was at Bloom. That's so funny. And I was like the decathlon. He was like, yeah, it was, a, it was like the same, uh, period of time that Bruce was, um, uh, in Montreal. Yep. I've yep. been 76. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I've that story 76. checks out. So Paul wasn't lying to me. Nope. That sounds about right to me. <laughs> right, that sounds about right to me. I don't know. I just, uh, I just, I should have just stuck with pole balding and, yeah. and not tried it, but I, I did try it and it just, just, uh, it's appealing. A like, I mean, if you're an athlete, you know, it yep. just is, it is, there is some appeal to it for sure. But yeah, well, I could, you know, I long jump twenty five low. I could high jump six eight. Wow. I ran, I ran uh, ten four hundred meters. I could run. I was good at running. Right. Uh, you know, I'd anchor our relays in high school and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I, I but uh, I just kept getting hurt. It just wasn't any good. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems like a, a sport that would really, uh, you know, put a lot of stress on your body. It's and also, also and during the days when steroids mm. was really in the sport uh yeah they were testing 72 olympics was the first game so they tested people for that type of thing but um i think uh i think a lot of people had figured out over the next couple three years how to get around the testing right my my opinion on it I, and i really didn't want to be part of all that I, I didn't do sport i didn't do track and field i didn't do sports um with that mentality. I just, it was fun to me. I just like doing it. Right. And right. I, you know, it was just fun. So. You, uh, you know, obviously, uh, don't have to mention any names, but during that like time frame, was there Uh-oh. a lot of vaulters? That, a lot of vaulters? That you, Royden? That you know, that not you that knew? I know of. Okay. Yeah. I just, with so a lot of the podcasts, athletes, Royden. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> Hey, yeah. Okay. <laughs> there was a lot of uh <laughs> Whoops. there was a lot of stuff going on back then and it's just very I don't know, it's hard because it's you know There were people loaning each other piss. Okay. Well maybe that no, was, was going just on for all the time. Else. Maybe that was for something else. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. People were if you were clean, there were people who wanted to borrow your pee. Really? How much does a bottle of pee go for? Depends upon what metal you got. Okay. Just kidding, big guy. <laughs> uh, no, it, truly, though, uh, yeah, I had uh, people asking to borrow my pee in 72. Right. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. They actually had a little, I won the Pan Am Games in 71 that were in Cali, Columbia, and uh, they were doing a little bit of kind of preliminary playing around with the testing 
that they were going to do. Apparently, it was kind of the testing was kind of new in the sport, and uh, there was there, there was uh, people learning how to get around the system at that point. That's crazy. Yeah. Did have, did you ever see that uh, documentary Icarus on Netflix? Mm-hmm. Yep. That was crazy. Careful with that. Yeah. That yeah. was that was crazy, man. Yeah. That was know. a the, really wild the, one. The, I, I, I just I don't know. I just to me high school was high school was the most fun frankly yeah. you know what do you think changed uh you know as you went up from this you know kind of having a good time high school guy to college then to after college well first of all i never should have went to university of kansas university of kansas was the best track team in the country bob timmons was the head coach there who coached Jim Ryan. Jim Ryan, of course, is a great, great, great middle distance runner. The first prep to run under four minutes in the mile. I think he ran 358 in high school in the mile. That's crazy. You know, many time national champion, couple three time Olympian. I think Jim Ryan made the 68 Olympic teams. Yeah, in high school. And uh, they both went to Kansas, and a lot of us went to Kansas, and they were national champs a couple of times at Kansas, and that's why I went there. In the late 80s, I'm sorry, in the late 60s, so much anti-Vietnam War feeling among young people who didn't want to go serve and and people that didn't want to see people go serve. Now, my dad served in World War II, and he was totally against uh, the war in Vietnam Mm -hmm. and what was going on that way. And uh, I immediately at Kansas got into just a war with Bob Timmons over the length of my hair, Mm -hmm. how all that was going to be. And every kid on campus is growing their hair out long and wanted that. Uh, and I wanted to. I just wanted to fit in with campus. Mm-hmm. But he wanted everybody to have a GI clip. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not kidding. Really? He held the me out of a couple. Tight. Held me out of a couple of meets. Checked my hair. I had to get a haircut before the Kansas relays and have my hair checked before he would let me go on the field to jump that day. And I won Kansas relays that day as a freshman with my new haircut in 19. 19- in 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 April of 1969. So you got the haircut. I did get the haircut. What? I was jumping great, and I wanted to go jump in the meet. I didn't want the haircut. Right, right. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so then obviously that didn't probably go over very well, and then you transferred to Alabama from there? Well, a year later, I'm jumping a foot higher yet, and um, <laughs> the Kent State shootings happened where the National Guard shot – four students dead on campus at Kent State in an anti-Vietnam War protest at the University at, at University of Kansas uh, at the end of April 1960, 1970. Uh, somebody blew up half of the student union. There were several other schools that had major... Uh, problems around the country like that and schools all across America shut down colleges shut down a month early that year a month wow. early uh, we were still going to go to nationals and the nationals our NCAA nationals were going to be at uh, Drake University mm-hmm. and I had jumped uh, 16 8 or 9 that year and I was uh one of the top couple of college guys and uh, uh, Tad Scales, our high school teammate, and uh, Bill Hatcher and I would practice by ourselves. And during those six weeks or eight weeks, my hair got longer and longer and longer and Bob Timmons never saw me. And then uh, I show up at the NCAA meet uh, for prelims and he's like, oh my (laughs) God, we can't let you jump like this. So I promised him I would go get a haircut. My parents are there too, by the way. And the meat gets uh, a huge rainstorm hits. So they end up moving the pole vault from the outdoor to the indoor. It's the outdoor meat. Right. And uh, we have the meat indoors. And I set the world record at 17.7. And I never got the haircut. And he was so pissed off at me. It was ridiculous. Yeah. That's crazy. Is that crazy or what? That's wild. So you did did that at Drake? (laughs) 
That was at Drake University. At that little tiny, in that little that tiny, little tiny field area. house. And I jumped in there, yeah. With the, and you run off the turn, it's yeah. downhill, it's a <laughs> yeah. bank turn, and you run off the turn. Yeah, in that field house. It was cool, though. My parents are right there. It was so fun. Oh, I bet. So, it was a really cool crowd all standing on the floor. Yeah. And there I was with my uh, with my long hair, and Bob Timmons is standing over in the corner. And you could just see the smoke coming out of his ears, man. He was mad. He was way mad. But he couldn't do anything about it, and I had a great day. Yeah, you can't really complain after that. Then right? he kicked me off the team. We went to, uh, he took five or six of us on a trip to the Caribbean. We went to Port-au-Prince. Martinique, Trinidad, Tobago. We went to four or five places and just did little track clinics. I jumped 16-4 on army cots and, uh, on a grass runway, actually, uh, uh, at that clinic. I got some great pictures of it. And a um, uh, couple of us went out one night. This is about two nights before the tour, so we were out there two weeks. And uh, we went out one night and... You know, we were drinking a little bit and all that kind of shit. And we got back to the, we got back late and he kicked me off the team uh, at the Miami airport uh, for going out. <laughs> That's he crazy. kicked me off the team. So then I called up and he let me back on the team and I go back to, uh, I go back to KU. I kind of didn't want to go really, but I went anyway for fall semester. And um, a guy named Jack Scott had written a book about the problems that were going on in college and in high school sports with dress and hair and what you believed in and that type of stuff. Anyway, Jack Scott came and made a speech at KU, and we went out and talked to Jack Scott, a bunch of us, several of us, and we all got kicked off the team. That was my final time of getting kicked off the team for going and talking to Jack Scott. Wow, isn't that crazy? But that's how that's how the politics were. That, yeah. that that's that's how the uh, that's how the cultural revolution was. And that that book I wrote, the the high flyer and the cultural revolution. That's really what that book was all about, telling yeah. those stories. You know. Yeah, that was a I mean a crazy time back then. Yeah, just for the country as a whole. Yeah, yeah, that's know? right. The whole yeah, that's right. Well, what's kind of crazy in the country right now a little bit for different reasons. Right. Uh, a little bit, but we, we're having some crazy times right now. That what was that one guy that was the president for a while? Donald Trump. Dumper Trump. Dumper <laughs> Trump. Dumper Trump. Dumper Trump. Something like that. Okay, I, I, I shut up on that one now. <laughs> yeah. Roger that. Yeah, she. Uh, my daughter is. Uh, she's a. A, like a dancer, but she's just got this personality that's just like crazy personality. And uh, she went up to her uh, lunch supervisor at lunch yep. and was like, hey, can I have the microphone to oh. sing the lunchroom a song? Uh-oh. I was like, holy cow, the confidence of a little kid, man. Uh-oh. And how old is she? She's eight. Wow. Just just like I'll sing a song to everybody in here. That's really. She doesn't even know how to sing. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's hey, awesome. You know, keep keep that fire going. But yeah, so I guess we can talk about your daughter. How was that coaching Chelsea? And just uh, you know, actually, we were off the off the podcast talking about her kind of start in that thing. It was pretty crazy. If you want to, yeah, I think I think she had watched and seen pole vaulting a lot. You know, because of the club, but she never pole vaulted. She, as a little kid, they'd come and play, swing on our rope vault all the time, play on the trampoline all the time. You know, I'm kind of a gymnastics more type coach, I guess, in some ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, she'd placed second or third in the 100 meter hurdles at the Cali State Meet. You got to be blazing fast to right. do that. And the 300 hurdles, she's third or fourth a uh, couple years in a row. And, then after Shayla set the high school national high school record, Chelsea comes in and she goes, you know, you think I ought to try that? And I'm like, yeah, you could try it. <laughs> it's like November of senior year. She plays soccer and volleyball also. So she would uh, come home uh, after school and we'd start just doing a little short run pole vault in a little bit. And when track season started, uh, she just got better and better and better and ended up jumping 13-6 winning the California state meet in her first year of pole vaulting. She'd probably been pole vaulting six or eight months at that point. And then went to UCLA and ultimately jumped what 15, seven, I think 
second right. second uh, in the world championships. But our family's been that way. My son, you know, um, jumped sixteen two in high school and never practiced. <laughs> Almost never. <laughs> He's a surfer. That's crazy. Go, he, you know, he was into surfing, and I was in, and I'm into surfing, and uh, I, I didn't say anything, and he didn't really want to pole vault in college, and the guy was, you know, tall and slender, and he, you know, could have been real fast, but, uh, and then of course Tim set the national indoor high school record, sixteen seven, uh, in 1974. We've had some pretty good uh, pole vaulters in the family, in the Johnson family. Absolutely, that's pretty decent. Yeah, you know? it's really, really, really decent. Yeah, that's uh, – I'm worried – I don't know if worried's the right word, but I'm – I don't – people always come up to me, as they probably did you whenever you were a, a young father, and it's like, are your kids going to pole vault? Oh, man, you know, like they come to you and say, man, wait till your kids pole vault. And I'm like, I don't know. Like I, I don't, I don't want to force them to pole vault. If they want to pole vault, then, you know, they've got a great – platform to do it from but you got to find that thing you like to do right right and i just sometimes i'm like i want to save them from the heartache (laughs) well it's a good point you know it's hard and and i remember what it did on me and and how much of my life i dedicated to it and how much heartache i dealt with you know just trying to be yep the best that i could possibly be yep but then I go back and I'm like, well, they're going to do that in something. You yep. know, you're going to be driven towards something. And, and part of being driven and being the best at, at what you being living up to your potential is dealing with heartache and let down and, yep. and things like that. Yep, that's right. And so many of the other sports, I think, I think playing volleyball for Chelsea was great. It's good for the jumping. It's good for those type of things. Playing soccer was really good. Um, you know, Clay was the same way. Tim was a really good sprinter in high school. I think he was second in the Illinois State meet his senior year. Those things, those activities make you better, mm-hmm. give you a better basis, you know, for pole vaulting. Just if that's an, what you want to do. Yeah. As an athlete. Yeah. I yeah. ran cross country in high school. So you know, I. I just liked it. It was fun. I liked it. Um, so I don't know, you know, I didn't really want to go play football or anything like that. I just wasn't interested in that type of thing. Right. So, but you just got to find something you like to do. If you like to do it, if it's fun, uh, then you keep doing it and maybe you can get good at it. You yeah. Know? I don't know. Absolutely. I mean, I made money. Uh, my red shirt year when I transferred from Kansas to Alabama. Oh, I shouldn't even say this. Let's maybe I'll it. shut up. Let I traveled to so many meets. By myself, because I'm not on the team. And in those days, you had to red shirt. And everywhere I went as a world indoor record holder, they're paying you cash under the table. Every single place. To the LA Times indoor meet, to the San Francisco indoor meet, to the big meets they had in New York, to the summer I spent in Europe. You know? Right. I mean, it was awesome. Yeah, I but bet it that's was. Just, uh, but in those days, you were supposed to be an amateur. You know, today it's a it's a different thing. But right. They would pay you meet expenses, and part of that would be your benefit. If I jumped really high someplace, they'd pay you a bonus. It's just the way it was. Yeah. And it's taken, it took the sport, what, 40 or 50 years from a rule standpoint to catch up to that. Yeah. Can you pull this just a little bit more centered? And there you go, right there, perfect, perfect. Yep, there we go. Yep. Um, yeah, that's one thing that really I think personally, as you know, you could probably see with you know, kind of what we're doing at Rise and and what what we're trying to do in in the sport is the discussion around like money and around business. Um, because in order for, I, personally, I believe that in order for the pole vault to continue to progress and get better and better and have better facilities and better poles and better research and better this and better that, I think that there has to be a larger number of individuals that are interested in the business of how things can can function business wise and people pole vaulting has always been not always but it's kind of always been like a 
uh, you should you should volunteer your time just for the love of the mm-hmm. sport. Yep. You know, people do that. Okay. Well, you know, the thing is, is like with your with your sky jumpers uh, camps. I think that was really the first time in America where it was like, all right, somebody's going to go after this thing and they're going to go after it. It's good. They're going to charge money, but you're going to get a lot of value for your money. And we're going to make it to where the education of pole vaulting and the experience of pole vaulting is opened up to more people and things like that. What are your thoughts on just where pole vaulting is has been in the past, where it's at now, and where it should be going in the future. I think because of clubs, there's a lot more people out there that kind of have a better idea of how progression should work and how the uh, how how that type part of the education should work. I, I think that I think that part's really important. Uh, I would hate to see it ever become a club only sport, kind of like mm-hmm. gymnastics is in some places, I guess, a little bit. Um, you know, um, I think it's good because we have improved the the injuries. There's still injuries; it still goes on a little bit, but but you know we have that problem a little bit still. But it it has gotten better, um, and um, I think uh, I think it's good that kids that pole vaulted uh, when they kind of get done with their with their uh, competitive career like to go coach a little bit i think that part's good too that's how you get it passed along it's right. important right it's really important you know what uh inspired you to start uh sky jumpers and and just your whole <laughs> business club what, mm-hmm. you know that whole thing in alabama and at kansas um there was kids at schools in the area that wanted to learn how to pole vault and would come to Tusk to, to Alabama to jump a little bit, just jump, just, you know, at, at our practices in Kansas was the same way. And I think that that just turned into the next step, having, having, uh, having a club and having camps. And I think I might've had the first, maybe Bill Falk had the first one. It was either Bill Falk or I had the first pole vault camps in America. And I'm pretty darn sure I had the first pole vault club in America. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, it's still going strong today, you know, I mean, yeah. So I would, I would, you know, definitely say that you are the godfather <laughs> of, <laughs> no, for real, of what, yeah. All of this has become because somebody like me could look at at your situation and your club and and what you've done with it and it could say it's possible. Yeah. You good. Well, it's going to overheat again. Five more minutes. Right. Right. We should talk about we yeah. should talk about all my work on the, and cushioning the plant box. It'd be a good thing to do then if we're short yeah. on time a little bit. Yeah, it might be a good. Well, thing. Well, do you if it's going to overheat in five minutes? Do you just want to do like a decent break? It's not literally when I start doing this, the thing went away. Oh my gosh! Okay. Um, all right. Well, we'll just get back to uh, just really quick. So I think that you're the godfather of what all of this has become you're the first person who took it and proved yes you can do this and you can be employed you can do this as as like your livelihood and it can flourish and it's crazy to see where it's gone now and i think it's gonna it's just at the very beginning stages of what it's going to be yeah i think you're right i mean i'm 73 years old uh i'm retired I, I do it now as a, as a hobby. Mm-hmm. The truth is, um, you know, but yeah, I've been extremely lucky that for a decent part of my income and I have other things I do, but, um, pole vaulting has been there and I've been able to stay uh, involved in it the way, way it has happened. That part's awesome. It's really cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because it's now it'll be cool at the end of it. You'll be able to see where all of that, all of this stuff Mm -hmm. came from. It came from just a small little thing that you were doing, 
putting out sky systems yeah. and showing like, hey, pole vaulting's a good time, man. It's making, a lot of fun. Make, making sky systems videos was super fun. We watched a couple sky systems tapes at the camp in Ohio <laughs> last week. And I sit there now and I look at it and I go, wow, how did I do that? You it's, know, it's insane. The bloopers, the other stuff that's in it. Uh, it was just fun to me. We loved it. There's uh, there's one uh, in there. I think it was the 72 Olympics uh, with the big payback, the uh, James Brown song. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forget which Sky Systems it's in. <gasps> Get but, down with your baby. <laughs> but that I used to watch that yeah. on repeat every time before I was getting You're ready cracking to go me jump, up big man. guy yeah I, I, well, I always had the love for rock and roll too you yeah. know and yeah. I and I put rock and roll on the tapes was a lot of fun it was easy yeah <laughs> so what are you working on now oh well, I filed and won a patent a few years ago for a cushion plant box, and we've done a whole bunch of work on it where uh, we've, um, well, there's several problems with the box. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, the box grinds and pulls up. You can see it on your on your box over here and over here where all those scratches are in the back, and you look on every single pole yeah. uh, that's out there. Um, and it doesn't matter if you tape the bottom of the pole up or you put a plastic piece on it. Uh, it's going to chew the bottom of the pole up. And I've seen several poles break on the bottom. So I want to get rid of that. Mm-hmm. Um if you go around the country, particularly in the freeze-thaw parts of America, um, elevated front lips have caused a whole bunch of accidents. Yeah, that's Terrible, bad. That's absolutely bad. horrible. That's bad. And the way that the some of the manufacturers design their box, there's a box now, and I'm not going to name the company that makes it, but there's a box now where the pull slide goes down like this, and they got a metal front edge on it that's about two inches long like that. So when the pull falls onto the runway, it's hitting on that metal edge every single time. Yeah. Uh, I've seen I've seen a bunch of those around the country. Well, that's just uh, weakening and making a spot on the bottom of the pole where the pole's going to break. And, of course, breaking the bottom of the pole is one of the worst places you can break the pole because typically uh, when the pole breaks down there, then the end of the pole catches on the front of the pit Mm -hmm. and you got about a one thousandth of a second to let go and if you don't then you're going to land short um we had two of those happen back to back two years ago at one of our oh my god yeah right uh so i want to lower the front edge of the box between three quarters of an inch and one inch below the surface of the runway uh i want to have uh a flexible sidewall and bottom pan integrated with a hard end plate and plate where the pole rotates on the bottom. So the boxes that we're installing where I am is quarter inch plate steel, uh, but we've taken two inches off of the top of that plate steel and all that is rubberized around the surface. And I can send you guys info on this. And if you want to do an install here, maybe we'll come and do one at some point. We probably put 40 boxes in, maybe more around the country in different places. People want to do it. Stevens Point's got one where we do camp next week. I wanted to do one up there and just see how it survived in their weather. Is this the same one as the Skydex box? It is not the Skydex box. Okay. No. Uh, I no. Uh, I I, I want to see it where uh, the entire perimeter, a measured perimeter around the box, 33, basically the size of a box collar, is cushioned. Right. So you don't have to have a box collar. The collar is That's in the yeah. ground. You can. I, I want to make it where the collar can fit on top of this box. Mm-hmm. I want to make it where the dimensions and the size of this box are very similar. Mm-hmm. Certainly the depth of the box should be the same. We don't yeah. want to change that. Um, so that, that, that's what we've done. So this is, this is basically cushioning the sides and the bottom. We know we can reduce the... Uh, impact attenuation 90% on the bottom of the box. Impact attenuation. Can you Head injury that? criteria. Oh, I told AS, you earlier that it's uh, yep. it, it's uh, on concrete. It's probably 10,000 hit. 3,000 hit kills you. We can take uh, we can take the impact attenuation down on the bottom of the box to under 1,000 hit. 
Wow. We and and on the sidewalls. And Three thousand is the mark that we need to be under. That would be the best, right? Because you said three thousand is the one where it yeah. hits catastrophic. That's right. We want to lower wow. that. We want to lower that front edge. But if you think about it, if you lower your box front edge an inch, uh-huh. then you lose three or four right. degrees, degrees in bed cavity. Yeah. yeah. So then you're not. We want to make a bed cavity bigger. We don't want to make the bend cavity smaller. We right. want to make it bigger so the poles aren't grinding right. on there. So, uh, so, so I want to I want to make the angle of the back of the box between 108 and 110 degrees. Hmm. Right now, it's 105. Okay. We're lowering the front edge. When you lower the front edge, you lose bend cavity. We want to open that back up a little bit, and it can go beyond. Two or three degrees, it can go to all the way to 110. That's what we're jumping on at my house. That's what we're jumping on at places that I've installed them. And and the the box, the back of the box is is a higher degrees then, like so it'll is, it roll. Does it roll easier? I think. Well, I think there's just less abrasion. Right. Right. So the one thing that I would say is that uh, I talked with Don Rarick, who's uh, one of the engineers at uh, Essex. And he brought something up to me that was really, really crazy. I had no idea is that the Essex, the way the profile is, is they don't hit the back of the box, which is very interesting. They, we can, they, I can show they, you what, at what the is end. they, uh, the, the pole, like the bottom of the pole doesn't hit the back of the box. Now I haven't put like a super slow-mo video camera at the back of the box yet to see if that's happening, but I can show you afterwards that they're they're very there still are some a little bit of nicks and marks um but they're pretty clean you know at the end so anyway we could we can i can show you that afterwards but we'll go ahead for instance let's say we're uh just doing a swing up drill right and it would just, have to we're it gonna, would have to we're hit. gonna yeah and we're gonna land on our back in the pit it would have to hit sure it's rotating right, right on there that's so would you point. rather it that's rotated on a hard metal edge that's in many boxes. It's a sharp metal edge that it would rotate on. Right. Or would you rather it was rotating on two inches of rubber track surfacing on that top edge? Um, I can send you even some videos of it where people can see what goes on with this thing. Right. And it's like I was saying earlier. Um, I have pole vaulting several days a week on my property in my backyard right in california i want it to be as safe as it can be i don't want to have a big accident like that uh at my home Mm -hmm. but i love coaching pole vaulting and uh, so that's really why i've spent so many years and so much money and i showed you all those little prototypes that i was talking about it's amazing Uh, yeah um in an effort to do that. And one thing in that led to the next, mm-hmm. you know. And you just went down the rabbit hole. I just kept working on it. And it just ended up being, hey, we want flexible sidewalls on the bottom pan with cushioning underneath it, not concrete. We want a good way to be able to attach it to the runway sub base. That's why we bring the little the little things out on the side so you have something to screw into the sub sub base with. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, we have to change the... Uh, the end plate angle a little bit because we're going to lower the front edge a little bit. When you lower that front edge an inch or so, uh, that you lose two or three degrees at the end plate. We want to make the bend cavity bigger, not smaller. Mm-hmm. So and that's how, how many people do you know that know anything about pole vaulting that are actively working on safety solutions? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Um, I don't know any. Okay. I know people I've talked to to let me come and install their cushion boxes, my cushion boxes at their place because they see it and they go, oh, yeah, now I see what he's talking about. Right. Um, so that's, that's, that's and, and I think probably most of them have been in California. There's a few in the Midwest and a few in the East too. Uh, and usually I come and help them and do an install uh, and show them what to do. But I didn't want to push this thing until I saw that, it had the longevity that it needed to have. That was it my to concern, last. Yeah. 
That was my concern was yeah. though, there's actually a couple, a couple things that or three things that came into my mind whenever we were talking about this is number one, when, so the pole will still hit the back of the box. The top edges. Yeah. Yeah. Does the rubber like, because when, when you plant a pole, it, it hits the back of the box, it rolls through the center and then it kicks out to the side. Mm-hmm. Have you seen any, because of the rubber surface on the back of the box, does that create any friction whenever the we pole hoops out? I, I haven't seen a problem with that. We jump, on our boxes with the rubber there, it's the same basic general texture as this rubber here on this on this runway. Yeah. Um, uh, and then we go jump at other places that are not. We're we're gripping the same handhold heights. We're jumping on the same poles. The poles are going into the corners. Gotcha. And then we've also, you know, like I said, we've curved those out. We want to curve out those areas a little bit on the bend cavity. And I'll send you pictures of what that looks like uh i think that's important because that reduces the uh, amount of abrasion or amount of rubbing that goes on on that and i've got videos of what it looks like you know too so but you know you can walk right over there and look at your boxes just like we did a minute ago and you can see what's going on there right it's everywhere how much of the pushback on something like this is because it is going to be too much of a hassle. Hmm. Or too much money. Right. How much of yeah. the pushback is that as opposed to, because I'm what I'm concerned about is that somebody will, like, hopefully it's your solution. Hopefully mm. your solution, you know, works and checks all the boxes. Yep. I, I don't, pun intended. Um, hopefully it, it works but then if you get a product that works, I'm nervous that it won't be adapted, not because it's safer, but because manufacturers don't want to produce a new box. Uh, they don't want to go through the headache yep. and that it'll cost too much money. Uh, I don't think the manufacturers should even should have a say in it. I think the... Uh people that own the facilities should have the say in it. Do they want a safer place or not? Hmm. Do they want something that costs a huge amount or not? We have to keep the cost down. We have to make it done with materials that are commonly available. Hmm. Uh, We have to make it where any coach or uh, not any coach, but many coaches, parents, uh, grounds crews can do the install uh, 99% of the places you're going to have to be able to operate a jackhammer. You're going to have to go rent a jackhammer and probably have a sledgehammer and chop out, you know, that concrete around the edges. And I can send you, we have many videos and pictures of how it's done. Mm, so I would love to see that. Yeah, yeah. I can send you guys that stuff. I, gee whiz, I have a welding contract, a uh, welding shop that has built our boxes for us welding the you know the two pieces together the Mm -hmm. flexible sidewalls and bottom pan welded onto the uh, you know end plate um and it really doesn't cost very much to build them right it it doesn't at all um and uh, it needs to be able to stay in place you see the current boxes we have you can't put them in rubber playground mulch why because Uh. there's no way to attach them to the front edge of the runway Every box that's out there now, they have like a couple of little flanges, flanges on the sides where the concrete holds them into place from the middle. Right. Right. So right. we had to we had to get all that worked out too. So that's what we've done. Do okay. you have any preliminary pricing on what a pro, what the project cost would like cost to a high school? The project or the box? Put one in? Is there is a grounds crew going to do it or is a contractor going to come and do it? That's a big question. That's a very big question, <laughs> huh? You know, I'm building the I'm building the boxes for about 160 bucks each. Yeah. They they weld the box together and then I glue the pieces on the sides in the bottom. Uh-huh. And then uh, like I said, you're going to need about 5 gallons or I'm sorry, 5 bags of that rubber mulch, four and a half bucks a bag. Right? Right. And uh you're going to need two bags of uh, concrete 
Right. Because you're going to put concrete behind the back end of the box mm -hmm. uh, where it goes. Which that, would be under the pit. The uh, concrete would be under the pit. Well, the concrete, the concrete comes up to about two inches from the top edge of the box. And then it's uh, cushioning on top of that. Right. And then the top surface. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. I got you. And then is the plan for this to maybe put it into like a tight package that somebody yeah, could buy? That's up to the manufacturers. That's what I've done. Right. I send people a box and I send people a rubber parts if they want it. If they don't want the rubber parts, if they have their own rubber track surfacing, then right. they do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's options there. Uh, yeah. Very important. I mean, if a guy, yeah, that, that, you know, it's it's just, it can't cost too much. Uh, we were talking about Skydex. I'm not a fan of Skydex, and the reason is, is because Skydex has cups on the top of it. If you look at Skydex, it's clear plastic with all these little cups on the top. Uh -huh. We don't want the cups to fill up with water hmm. and freeze in the winter in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. Right. <laughs> And then how long is it until it all thaws out? We want the water from the rain and that type of stuff to matriculate into the ground. Mm -hmm. That's what we want. And we want those materials to uh, provide cushioning like shredded rubber playground mulch does. It's perfect for it. So I had to watch this for a long, 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 long time in a variety of places to see if the longevity works, if it, if and it did what I have, wanted And what do. are your results from that, like the longevity, like in your place in particular, like that you've been using? Well, the ones we're jumping on right now, one is seven years old and one is six years old, and they look awesome. And they... We spray paint the bottom of the box well, once yeah. in a while. But, right, right. But that's it. Uh, I, 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 I'm very happy with wow. how it's happened. I'm very happy with how it's happened. Uh, we, to we went through plastic. We, we started out using plastic. I thought plastic was going to be the best to do the sides and the bottom. Gee whiz. There's a lot of pole vaulting in my house. Mm. We wore out the plastic ones in a month. Where yeah. the, where the, where the pole would strike. So then, I, and I showed you those pictures, then I made a box where the plastic was just on the bottom, but not on the back where the pole strikes. Well, we wore that out in two months. <laughs> right. Because it's grinding right there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so that just made me uh, switch to metal, to galvanized uh, metal at, at the right gauge. Right, we right. We experimented with 20 gauge, 22 gauge, 24 gauge metal. We had to take a look at all those metals and uh, measure them to see what they are in inches so uh, and metric so we could uh, put them on an ASTM thing. I'll, I'll send you guys the whole thing. Everything, you yeah. can read the ASTM that I've written, and you can look at uh, at the poles, you know, working around the bend cavity. And there's no reason. The, the only problem I would say with bend cavity is if you make that angle too big. Mm. We experimented from 105 all the way to a 115 degree angle. Wow. Guess what? Around 112 degrees, the pole hits and climbs Starts the to back. Slip a little bit. Climbs up the back a little bit. Right. So then we experimented with putting ribs on the back of the box so it would climb. That was right. a failure. Uh, <laughs> well, this so is I just kept playing with yeah. it. It's it's incredible, and I think I just go back to that thing about the you know just you know people can do your job better until they got to do it. And the thing is, is, you know, the box collar situation and, and whatever else, you know, I really do applaud you for actively putting the rubber to the road and just actually trying, just trying to move it forward. I appreciate that. You know, um, the manufacturers have tried to made, make a cushion box for over 40 years mm. they were trying to make cushion boxes 40 years ago and they gave up they all tried yeah. it with plastic and they did those type of things we had cushion boxes uh, that i remember from when i was in high school and college but they all became failures and i think the industry just decided you couldn't do it they gave up mm -hmm. well 
Um, You're not I, giving up. I didn't give up. I, <laughs> I, I, I looked at I looked at the dynamics of what was going on. Well, you have a deep understanding of what needs to happen and what can't happen and what should happen and things like that. I think there's some people that uh, do that type of work for the manufacturers, and maybe they haven't had much experience with mm. the actual thing of pole vaulting. You know, it'd be a hell of a lot safer right now if we just dug a hole in it at the end of the runway and filled it up with sand. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I hate to say it's it, crazy. but it's true. Yeah. You know, uh, it would wild. be safer. Yeah. They yeah. Don't, nobody wants to do it, probably. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. That would be interesting but, you know, to try that out. Anyhow, that, that, that's the box thing. And we'll <laughs> see. I'm, I'm, I'm just happy uh, to uh, try to improve safety and try to improve pole vault education. And uh, obviously, I'm still going out running camps a little bit. And uh, that's part two. I'll come here and run a camp with you guys sometime if you yeah, want. We'll get that It'd going. Be fun to do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, I really, uh, I need a high bar, a rope vault, and a trampoline. But outside of that, we'll be okay. Yeah. Just sorry, boy. Sorry, boys. I, yeah, I was just right. kidding about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I look up at the ceiling. Whoops. We've been wanting to get a rope here for a long time. It's, uh, we'll talk about it. They after, told me but... uh, I had a rope fall in the side yard when we lived on Colima, um, in a Tascadero. That was our first row fault. We pulled the whole thing up when we sold that house and moved to our other house. Just pulled the stanchions up, moved it to a new place, and put it in. I moved it around two or three times. Yeah. In some ways, that was no different than what's going on with the box. Yeah. We were just experimenting with how to do rope faulting because it was obvious that it could be so similar Oh yeah, imitatively to it's a what great we do, and every place I go run a camp, we we usually do rope vaulting. It's so. it's the best. It's a really really good exercise. I just really, <laughs> to be honest with you, haven't figured out where I, I just to look do in it here. All. I could do it, but it would take some work. We'd have to drill some holes in the floor and put a frame up. Yep. Yep, that's what we'd have to do. <laughs> you know, but I'm really good with jackhammers. We'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jan, what uh, what else have you got going on this summer? You know, if anybody was interested in going to your camps, do you have any, you know, dates? Going, going or... to camp at Stevens Point this week. Okay. And then um, going home for a few for a week or two, and then I have a big camp in uh, Kutztown, Pennsylvania, uh, kind of mid-July. And then my camp at, at my place, uh, I think it's the 16th or 17th. Uh, of 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 July and um, we're having an ASTM uh, online meeting about all the stuff we've been talking about mm-hmm. uh, come up in July. I'm I'm a little bit busy this summer. Yeah, but you know what? I just love doing this. It's just fun. Yeah, I don't want to be sitting home bored doing nothing. Right. You know, you still surf. All I do is go surfing and riding bikes. Otherwise, yeah, I surf a little bit. I ride bike a lot of bit. Yeah. Central coast of California is cold water. Uh, maybe a little sharky mm. uh, in places. There's been some problems that way, um, but uh, I'm still surfing it a little bit, and then I ride bike a lot of bit. I've been able to stay pretty fit yeah. and uh, not have injuries, so that 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 part's been really good. Good so for you. And- I, I lift weights with the kids a little bit. Yeah. You know, I don't do any running. My wife is really a great runner. You know, Janie was a great uh, middle distance runner at Cal Poly and ran marathons, uh, professionally and did really well that way. Won several big marathons back in the day. Wow. So we have fun that way. Yeah. She won St. Louis marathon a couple times and a couple others. Yeah. Really did good. That's no, awesome. we have good genetics for sports in our family. Yeah. And reason. I think, uh, I think, uh, Trey and Chelsea have got some Whoops. pretty good genetics. Oh too. my God. <laughs> Jay, our, I'm sorry. Trey, Trey Hardy, Chelsea Johnson. Yeah. That's going to be insane. So hello, hopefully the uh, kids come, they come to our house, right? And, 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 and they're six, four and two and the six year old, every time they come, can we go in the backyard and pole vault now? I want to uh, swing on the rope. No, that's they're, gonna yeah, be we'll huge. see. That's going to be huge. We just have to live long enough now. Yeah. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. I want to, I want to see, I want to see what their kids are able to do. Uh, and, uh, that's, hope that, they're doing well, but that part's awesome. Jan, really appreciate it. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we can uh, do this again and maybe, I don't know, get a camp going in the future, but I appreciate your time. Thanks and for having all me. Your, fun. All your effort too. Okay, buddy. So, Hey, right. thank you. Thanks for having me. It was really fun. Absolutely. It's okay. the one more jump podcast. Rock see you guys and roll. Later. Rock and roll. 10, four. <laughs> <laughs>